Hello, I'm Bob Trubshaw. I'd like to talk to you today about two things which seemingly happened in the 14th century. One was the invention of Middle English, the language of Geoffrey Chaucer, and the second was the invention of the road movie. Well, except they weren't yet movies, but they were literary descriptions of journeys, such as Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Now, already some of you are quibbling. Middle English wasn't invented in the 14th century. Middle English has steadily evolved from Old English over the preceding 300 years. But, because nearly everything the Normans did was written down using French and Latin, then it wasn't until the late 14th century that English was once again being written down. And, for almost exactly the same reasons, stories about journeys and indeed tales told while making a journey, which is what the Canterbury Tales is made up of, they weren't invented in the 14th century. Instead, they were part of a long-established oral tradition. And, well, some of these oral traditions continue to be transmitted only by word of mouth and well-honed memory into the 20th century. And it's those traditions which shed light on the origins of the 14th century works, which are the precursors to road movies, and the whole plethora of YouTube content about folk using GoPro cameras to record their trips. So, more accurately, I'd like to talk to you today about journeys which have become legendary. Some may have started out as real journeys, but morphed over time into legends... And, well, some such legends were once integral to the lifestyles of the culture. The sort of journeys I'm thinking about are not the everyday ones, such as popping to the shops, going to work, or visiting a pub. I'm thinking of long journeys. And, well, the key difference is that a long journey, however long it might be, uses a route which has not been committed to memory. So it needs a map. Or, in the days before maps one or more legends, to act as a mnemonic. Now, most people have heard of the Australian Dreamtime songs, uh, commonly but wrongly called songlines. I don't want to use these, nor the many other examples from traditional cultures in far-flung places. I want to look at the examples from Britain. And, well, when the folk singer Chris Wood was interviewed by Nathaniel Handy in 2010, Chris had this to say. When the song lines thing came out, that wound me up, Chris fumed. People freaking out at this amazing Australian Aboriginal thing where they don't have a map, they just sing a song and then they know where they are. Well, Norfolk fishermen have been doing the same thing for generations. There's a song that tells you all the compass bearings and the landmarks that you would need to navigate from Yarmouth to Newcastle on Tyne. It's no different, but because the song lines happen in Australia, everyone is into it. The concept of anything so beautiful and rich and wonderful and canny happening here in our own country is just too much for people to get their heads around. Well, this video isn't going to be about the pilot verses or rutiers alluded to by Chris Wood. Instead, I'm going to look at their land-based counterparts, which are just as beautiful and rich and wonderful and canny, and seemingly also just too much for most people to get their heads around. Traditional cultures were often nomadic, or at least involved annual transhumance between winter and summer pastures for the animals. With traditional nomadic societies, then the metaphor of road movies simply doesn't work. Nomads spent all their lives on a road trip. For them, the whole shooting match of existence, from birth to death, happens on a stopping place on a journey. From quotidian tasks, such as accessing water, cooking and washing through to the rites of passage associated with birth, coming of age, marriage and death. Along the way, children are conceived, then born, and illnesses are overcome. And at the stopping places, all the society's traditions and practical skills will have been passed on from generation to generation. Let's look at an example. The Scottish traveller tradition, as conveyed by Stanley Robertson, sees the landscape through the eyes of a storyteller. Now, I can't emulate his Aberdeenshire brogue, but here's his own way of writing it. My mother used to say that this particular land here between the River Dee and the River Don, and they used to say long ago that the Don was the warlock and the River Dee was the witch, and this land between it was for her bairns. This land was always all ricked because there's only two hooses, but this road has been known for many, many supernatural happenings. There's a lot of happiness on this old road. 
Every time I gave up it, I could I sort of feel the spirits of the past. Until the early or mid-twentieth century, each family of Scottish travellers had their own annual circuit, and then, for part of each summer, they all came back together at the old road of Lomfanan in Aberdeenshire. So for Robertson, repeatedly visited places do not simply resound with legends and stories, but they are, as it were, the containers for the collective memories of his traveller culture. As a child in the late 1940s, Stanley rem remembers passing milestones on the road. At these places, his father would review a learning principle, asking questions to make sure he'd understood or had remembered from a previous year. Robertson referred to his society's oral culture as like the carrying stream of memory. Just as a stream only flows if there is water, so too all traditions are only sustained if passed on from generation to generation. Indeed, the passing on itself, the retelling, is integral to their culture. Stanley Robertson's way of remembering and retelling tales is deeply immersive. If Robertson had difficulty remembering a tale he would imagine himself back at the place where he heard it told. As he said, first of all, I try to remember the actual place where I heard the story, maybe Lumfanan, maybe some place camping. I try to remember the setting, everything, even the smells, everything to do with the senses. But how old are all traditions, really? How far back can we pick up descriptions of journeys? And well, despite one of the surviving old English poems being known as The Wanderer, we do not have any explicit descriptions of Anglo-Saxon journeys. And although the legendary hagiographies of Welsh and Cornish saints give the impression that their lives were spent on seemingly endless sacred journeys, these legends don't amount to what we quite call travel diaries. Only when Middle English emerges out of the oral realm and begins to be written down in the second half of the 14th century do we get three of the greatest works in Middle English, and all three describe road trips. This strongly suggests that there was an oral tradition, maintained while Norman French and Latin were the only languages being written, in which journeys were a common theme. The first of these is Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, where the whole framing story is about a pilgrimage, and each of the tales is presented as if being told by one of the pilgrims to all the other people in the group. The second is William Langland's The Vision of Piers Plowman, inspired by a journey from Shropshire to London, and while resting on the Malvern Hills, Langland experienced the vision. The third is an alliterative poem, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, written in Cheshire dialect by an author whose name isn't known, but referred to by scholars as the Pearl Poet, after the name of one of his other works. Now, while Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is not principally about a journey, nevertheless the poem starts by describing how Sir Gawain sets off from somewhere in or near Snowdonia, as Sir Gawain firstly keeps all the Isles of Anglesey on his left, then crosses by Ford at the Holy Head. So this is not Holyhead on Anglesey, but maybe either Hollywell near Flint or Pulford, the site of Poulton Abbey, which are both associated with the head-carrying St Winifred. From there, Sir Gawain proceeds to the Wirral and arrives at the liminal time between Christmas and New Year at Bertilax Castle, known as Hope Desert. Uh, Hope Desert, literally High Desert, seems to have been where Cheshire, Staffordshire and Derbyshire come together. Now, journeys are also integral to some medieval Welsh tales. Before they were written down in the 14th century, they were part of an oral tradition too. When collected and translated into English in the 1830s and 1840s, these tales became known as the Mabinogion. Well, I want to look specifically at tales relating to Taliesin. The artist and author Michael Dames recognised that the tales appertaining to Taliesin all take place in clearly named places in North and Mid Wales. While we now read the stories of Taliesin as if you like one big story, they actually started out as a sequence of much shorter, place-specific legends. Michael brought all his insights together in a book called Taliesin's Travels, which I published back in 2005. Now, ignoring all the finer details of his analysis, Michael identifies Thintegid, or Lake Bala, in Merionethshire as the birthplace of Taliesin who, at this period in his life, is still known as Gwion Bach. A few years later, Gwion is in a cave at Pont Newth in Denbyshire. 
He has a dream, and when he recounts that dream, he lists the landscape features that appeared. Boyce Valley, Arthur's Table, Bronwyn's Chair, Melangel's Bed, the Watch Hill, the Arm of the Giantess, and the Cairn of the Greyhound Bitch. Guillaume Bach transforms into Taliesin at Thingarionith. Michael Dames was fascinated by the name of this lake. Girionith combines girio, which means to enunciate, to phrase, with nithu, which means to spin. So it is the lake of spinning and weaving stories, or, as Michael Dames suggests, lake language. As if Lake Girionith, lake language, wasn't enough, Taliesin subsequently passes through Thea Thediath, which means the sea of half-speech. Dames's Taliesin Travels is a complex work that draws together both evidence and ideas from different time spans and different discourses to show how, at least from a modern perspective, key stages in Taliesin's life are intimately linked to specific places in the North Wales landscape. Dames's approach succeeds in bringing the landscape back to life, mythologically speaking, even though the surviving sources for the tales of Taliesin have now lost their intimate links with specific places. Quite independently of Michael Dames's research, for 30 years D.B. Bowen has been researching the prehistoric monuments in South Wales, including the chamber tombs in Pembrokeshire. Earlier this year, he and Olwyn Pritchard published a book called Hunting the Wild Megalith. They argue that these Neolithic chamber tombs, standing stones and other landmarks of a similar age were linked together by the legend of the Arthurian boar hunt. Just as with Taliesin, each place was associated with its own specific tale, but each of these place-specific tales was part of a much bigger narrative. Dewey himself refers to it as a Silurian songline. Now, if you've read Alan Garner's first novel, The Weird Stone of Brisigamin, you'll know that he starts off by retelling a traditional Cheshire legend about Alderley Edge. As a result, this tale is perhaps the best-known example of place-related lore being linked together into a journey. The oldest version of this legend was published in a letter to the Manchester Mail in 1805, and this was followed by an anonymous poem called The Iron Gates, A Legend of Alderley, published in the February 1839 edition of Blackwood's magazine. Alan Garner, who was born in Congleton, not that far from Alderley Edge, seemingly heard a version early in life, uh, from his grandfather. Allow me to retell the tale. I have included some of the details of the 19th century versions, which are not in Garner's version. As with Sir Gawain, the time is a liminal one, this time Halloween. For reasons unknown, a farmer living in Mobberley decides to sell a white mare at Macclesfield Market. This is slightly odd, as the journey will take him at least 12 miles and the terrain is difficult, including a scarp slope well over 100 metres high. And by waiting a week, he could have gone over level ground to Knutsford Horsefair, just three miles away. But this is not that odd. Farmers only ever buy from certain markets, and only sell at others. And which markets these are, follow precedent set by their fathers. Quite how many generations have maintained these traditions is unknown. But, given the generally conservative nature of farmers, we should have assumed that this is a long-established way of avoiding inbred livestock. Back to the legend. The mobbly farmer sets off before daybreak and rides the horse up the steep slope to the place known as Thieves' Hole. This is not a hole in the way you and I think, but a hollow way, a linear earthwork that's simultaneously a boundary, a one-time line of defence and a routeway. Alan Garner established that Thieves' Hole was once a crossroads. It took its name because in Old English it was a Theof's Lichgath, translates as where the thieves lie. This is not where they lie in wait. That sense of to lie was still in the future. These thieves lie in the earth, in death, after their execution at such a liminal location. Later generations of thieves would not lie at rest, but rather their corpses would be hung in gibbets at just such liminal execution sites. As if subliminally aware of the preternatural power of the place, the mare locks herself rigid. No matter what oath the farmer utters, she moves not an inch. Then he too freezes, at least for a moment. A tall old man, not much more to him than a ghost, but carrying a hefty stick in his hand, just appeared as if out of nowhere. 
without a word of greeting, he speaks. She is just the mare I am after. How much will you sell her for? I'll not sell to the likes of you, retorts the farmer. I'll get a better price at the market. Be on your way, then, the old man replies, with a harshness to his voice. Mark my words, she will not be sold this day. But when you come back this way tonight, I'll be here waiting for you. With that, the mare moves forward and continues on her way to Macclesfield, and they stand at the fair. Despite the farmer being told many times what a fine animal she is, no one offers to buy her. Not one. Far from having some money to celebrate with a few drinks in the local inn, and take some ribbons back for his wife, as she asked, he faces a long and difficult journey home in the gathering dark, with no doubt uh, some harsh words from his missus when he does arrive, uh, not to mention the risk of meeting that strange old man at Thieves' Hole again. He sets off as soon as he can, but by the time he arrives at the thieves' hole, the sun has just slipped below the horizon. Now will you sell her? The familiar voice challenges. The farmer turns towards where the voice came from. Knowing that he is little in the way of bargaining power, he can only ask, how much are you offering? Enough, comes the enigmatic reply. Follow me. As if it was an already agreed a deal, the old man sets off. As if in trance, the farmer and the mare follow into the growing dark. The route they followed wasn't direct, but zigzagged between some curiously named local landmarks on the high ground near Alderley Edge. First to Seven Firths, then to Goldenstern, detouring to Stormy Point, before climbing up to Saddle Bowl. On Saddle Bowl is a massive boulder, not much smaller than the farmer's house. The old man strikes this rock with his staff, and with a clatter, the rock splits open to reveal a pair of iron gates beyond. A slightly more gentle touch from the staff, and these two open, and the old man, the farmer, and the mare walk through, into a cave in the hillside. Except, as the farmer's eyes become accustomed to the dark, he sees the cave opens out into a massive cavern, and from that cavern other caves lead off. Fearing that he is being led into the land of fairy, a hollow hill from which he may escape, if at all, only a hundred or more years in the future, he cries out to the old man, Let me go, just keep the horse, I'll take no money from you, just let me leave this place right now. No harm will come to you if you stay, reassures the old man. Continue to follow me, and you'll come to no harm at all. And when they have crossed the cavern, and approach one of the caves beyond, he hears the sound of snoring. Not of one man, but of many. And as he enters the cave, the limited light reveals that each of these snoring men is dressed in armour. How many men he cannot count in the gloom. But each one rests his head against the side of a white horse, except one. One has no horse. This, announced the old man, this is the sleeping army. These knights are resting, and will continue to rest until of the day of the world's final battle. And when that day comes, I must awaken them. But as you notice, one is without a horse. Yours is the horse I want. Leave her here. Come with me. The farmer follows to another cave, and is bewildered by the sight of so much gold, silver, other treasure. Some of it stored neatly, but some of it is spilled onto the floor. Just a handful would make the farmer a rich man. Were he to take his hat off and fill it to the brim, he would be rich beyond his wildest dreams. Have as much as you can carry, says the old man. That's your rightful payment. Without so much of a thought of shaking hands to agree the deal, the farmer fills the pockets in his breeches with the brightest and shiniest of the golden coins. He indeed takes his hat off and empties another large pot of coins into it, not bothering that a good many spill onto the floor. More coins he slides between his riding boots and his legs, yet there seems to be as much treasure as when he first set eyes in the cave. He takes off his jacket and use it to wrap around some jewellery and some other big pieces of treasure. He can barely walk under the weight of what he has taken in exchange for the mare, but the old man simply nods and says once more, Follow me. They go back out, through the iron gates, and the rock, which clatters again before shutting with a resounding bang. The night is as dark as if a bag were over the farmer's head. Eventually he arrives home. He cannot hide his new-found wealth from his friends, and they demand to know how he came by it. He tells them the tale of the old man, and the circuitous route to the Iron Gates. 
They tell their friends the tale too, and soon a large number of men make their way up to Saddlebowl. But the rock resolutely remains in one piece, and neither the Iron Gates, the Sleeping Knights, or the hidden treasure have ever been seen since. Now, I've recounted the legend of Old Lee in detail because it's by far the best constructed example of how the names and legends of individual places form part of a greater narrative. But, in the final analysis, it is only a construction, not a genuine tradition. Garner was told the tale by his grandfather, but his grandfather got to know, directly or otherwise, the tale from the mid-19th century literary versions. And, well, as Jeremy Hart has astutely described, despite Garner's pronouncements about old English place names, this tale is a back formation, admittedly a seductively clever one, that dates back little, if at all, before its first appearance in print, which was 1805. For example, the tale shares much too much with the Scottish tales of Thomas the Rhymer, so it's a good example of how a well-known legend relocates to a new locality. Um, The proliferation of candidates for King Arthur's Camelot is perhaps the best example of how the same legend can be retold in different parts of the country, with the key castle or mountain or whatever always being one that the audience will be familiar with, not somewhere several counties away. Sir Garner's Old Lee Edge legend is not so much a fake as part of a tradition which has always retold stories in local contexts, especially stories and tales which link together specific places in a locality. After all, as Chaucer's Canterbury Tales depicts so well, legendary stories were not only about specific places, but they were told to fellow travellers on actual journeys between those places. In the days before maps, these tales formed the mnemonics needed to remember the roots of long journeys, the ones not previously committed to memory. If this video makes you think a little deeper about the origins of road trips in movies, and well, as also as the ubiquitous YouTube meme, then I'll be happy. It has made me think about doing videos of my own about a few personal legendary journeys in the 1980s, 